Hello, and welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. On this episode of Crushing Classical, I interviewed Tom Cowan, software company entrepreneur and faculty member at Columbia University in New York City. A horn player himself, I like to think of Tom as a friend of horn players. He grew up with the late Kendall Betts, former principal horn of the Minnesota Orchestra and founder of the Kendall Betts Horn Camp. Tom had at one time considered a career in horn, but he knew his talents lied elsewhere and instead went into the business world working for IBM and building 11 software companies. I had Tom on the show because I think his insights on entrepreneurism and building businesses are great for musicians who are building their own careers. Tom is currently on the faculty at Columbia University in New York City and continues to play horn every day. He is also the president of the Kendall Betts Horn Camp. It was really great to talk with Tom and hear his viewpoint on being an entrepreneur and how that mindset translates to musicians. Let's get started. Hey, Tom, welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. So would you please describe yourself to me in one sentence? I am a family man, a friend, a learning machine, and a mentor. How's that? That's great. I love learning machine. (laughs) So, you know, that's, I think you've got to, you've got to, to stay in that posture because I think too many of us tend to fall away from it because it gets hard. You know, once you're out of the, out of the structure of, of institutions and, and academics and school and, and all that, it becomes hard to, uh, to stay that way. But, but I try. I agree. It's hard to push yourself because, well, it's hard. So it's just (laughs) easier not to. That sounded really not intelligent, but yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, so tell me more about your career. So I, I was introduced to you by Bernard Scully and because you are a horn player. And I want to know more about your start in horn and then your, you know, your career, ultimately what you did, which was not music. So tell tell me a little bit about your background. So Bernard is very kind to call me a horn player because I'm a very bad horn player. <laughs> when you have when your when your when your uh, your measuring stick is uh, is Bernard Scully and Kendall Betts and Bill Caballero and all these people, you um, you quickly learn that that it may be a stretch to call yourself uh, anything more than just a really amateur horn player. But but uh, I started playing horn when I was when I was in grade school and continued playing all the way. And and I still play uh, pretty much every day, not very much at times, but, uh, but I love, I love the instrument. I love the sound. I love the, um, the expressiveness of the horn. Uh, But I decided that I should, um, I should stay in the, uh, in the path that my, my ancestors had been, which is in the business world. So I, um, I ended up after graduate school, school and graduate school, I ended up working for IBM for a number of years and uh, got bored and then started building software companies. And I claim I build seven software companies. My son claims I built 11. He counts the ones that didn't work and I only count the ones that did. That's the difference between he's an investor, he's a venture capitalist these days, and I, I'm an entrepreneur. So we don't count the ones that didn't work, Tracy. <laughs> but uh, then I went on and decided uh, about a year ago, well, a little over a year ago, that that building companies is a young man's game. So I turned to academics. I'm now uh, full time at Columbia University, where I am on the administrative and faculty side, and and actually I'm also um, uh, continuing on in my own education and finishing my doctorate there. So. That is what I'm doing these days. Great. So you have such a close relationship with with, um, horn players, and I know you were really good friends with Kendall Betts. So you really saw the inside, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing with the business or with the music world. And I wonder um, what you see in the music world or what you've seen in the entrepreneurial and business life that the music world can't see or doesn't consider. 
You know, um, I would say that uh, that the one of the one of the things that's difficult is what I call um, selective competition. Mm-hmm. And you and I have talked about this before. Uh, yeah. But it's the idea that you choose to compete in certain things and choose not to compete in others. Uh, and, and to me, that is one of, the, one of the lessons that I've seen that's crossed over from my experience in music and my experience in business and uh, large corporations and also in uh, on the entrepreneurial world is that uh, making a deliberate choice, Tracy, to say to yourself, I'm going to compete in this area uh, and I'm going to do it with all of my energy and all of my skill and all of my, uh, my time versus uh, deciding that you don't have the right knowledge and you don't have the right skills and you don't have the right talent um, and deciding that if, you, if that's the case, that you're better off not competing in that world. So I'll give I'll give you a uh, you know a quick story. When I was when I was an undergraduate at uh, Wake Forest University in North Carolina, not far from where you are, mm-hmm. the uh, I had played golf. I know it's going to sound strange, but <laughs> growing up in South Carolina, uh, we lived um, near a public golf course, and I played golf almost every single day when I was in middle school and high school, uh-huh. literally every day. And I decided that I was a pretty good golfer uh, because my scope of competition were the people that I saw on the golf course there. Uh-huh. So I go to Wake Forest and Wake Forest, for those that don't know, is the home of Arnold Palmer. And then later on, a lot of famous professional golfers, And when I went there, Wake Forest only had one scholarship um, in non-academic areas, and it was for golf. Uh, They had a woman's uh, a place for a a full scholarship for a woman golfer and for a male golfer. And the year I was there, a fellow named Lanny Watkins had won that scholarship. And so I decided I was going to try out for the golf team. So I went out, and there were probably 15 of us that, we're trying out. And to make a long story short, I played pretty well, uh, but I was nowhere close to what Lanny Watkins and the handful of other really professional golfers were at in terms of their abilities. And at the end of the first day, the golf coach there, Jesse Haddock, came to the a, bol- a bunch of us. It was probably 10 of the of the 15 or 18 folks and said to us something that has stayed with me to this day. He said, and this is almost verbatim. He said, you know, you guys, you all, cause it wasn't just men, you all could play golf at almost any university in the United States, but you cannot play golf here. Wow. <laughs> and he turned around and walked out, <laughs> you know, You know, to this day, Tracy, that lesson has stayed with me that you can think you're good and you can think you're talented, but there is a difference between world-class talent and the rest. You know, and you went to one of the finest uh, music schools in our country. You went to IU, right? That's right. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. And I know it's not supposed to be this way. You're supposed to be asking me, but (laughs) anyway. So Tracy, how good was the worst horn player at IU? Yeah, not good. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And so here you are at one of the best music schools we have. And the span of talent goes from world class to not very good. Yeah. That's pretty much the way things are in the world. And the one thing I learned in in being an entrepreneur for the last 17 years was the lesson of figuring out what is your world-class skill. 
because world class, and I shouldn't even say skill, Tracy, it's really talent. You know, okay. the world class talent, because world class talent is rare. You know, we see it in the horn world, and of the thousands of horn players, there are probably what, 25 maybe that are really world class, maybe 30. Yeah. Um, that are world class talents. Um, that's not a lot, but in everything that's that exists in this world, there is world class talent, and I contend that you have it. You just have to figure out what it is, and it's usually, unfortunately, not what we're passionate about. So it's, you know, it's not me playing the horn. I mean, another another example of that is. You know, I grew up um, with uh, with an outstanding horn player, Kendall Betts, and he and I were young men together. And you know, I would listen to Kendall play, and there was just a completely different level in his ability to do things than mine. Uh, just natural ability, and sure, I could be expressive with a horn, but I couldn't do it anywhere nearly with the ability that Kendall could do it, you know, and, and one day he, and we were, you know, young, young men at that point. And one day he looked at me and he goes, and this is, you know, another, uh, bucket of cold water in the face. He looks at me and he says, you know, the best you're ever going to be able to do is play third horn in Phoenix. <laughs> now I should tell you that I know the Phoenix horn players these days because I happen to have a home in Arizona, which is where I am right now. It's beautiful and sunny out here. And warm. So I know Gabe Kovach, who's the principal there. I know the whole horn section. They are outstanding players. They're much better than I was I ever was. But but the point that Kendall was making to me was that I what I shouldn't try to kid myself that my abilities of playing horn were good. I was all state band and all you know and the orchestra and all that, but I was not world class. So those lessons are the ones that began to point me in the direction of trying to figure out what my world-class skill was and, and zeroing in on that. It turned out to be building companies. Um, I did, you know, built a bunch of companies and I've had a good life and I've enjoyed it a lot, but I've kept the things, even though I've become passionate about that, my real passion in my early life was playing golf and playing horn. Those today, I don't even play golf, and I haven't played golf since the day Jesse Haddock told me I couldn't play golf anymore. <laughs> and literally, I haven't picked up a golf course. Kendall Golf Club. Kendall tried to get me to play a few times up in New Hampshire, and I did, but I didn't enjoy it. Horn's another, another thing. I did keep that up and do keep it up, but I keep it in perspective. To me, horn is a passion, but I do it for fun. You know, I, I find that so amazing that 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 golf he was the coach right yeah. at Wake Forest that he said that and um it's great that it had such a powerful impact on you not to say that it was bad that he you know killed your dream of being on the golf team oh. or whatever but that he just he said it like it was he was honest and truthful and then it was like as if it was a fact he didn't he didn't tell you you were terrible you know he just said, this is how things are. This is how it is here where you are. And that's it. You know, and, and you got the whole concept of selective competition that way. I mean, did you make up that term or am I just, you know, I will say yes, but I'm sure I'll be proven wrong the moment I say <laughs> that. <laughs> well, I like it because you just, you're selecting where you want, where you need to be competitive and where where it's just uh, maybe not the best idea. And in the in the world of music today, I mean, I just think that we need to start looking at it more like a business and be honest with ourselves about what our true abilities are and what our contribution can be. You know, I think um, one of the things that it was has helped me in this is having... Uh, really good sound. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily mentors, but advisors or friends 
mm-hmm. that are intellectually honest with you, uh, yeah. not with you, but with me, uh, right. about what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. I mean, to this day, my friends who we do a lot of things with um, on the business side, on the academic side, we all pretty well know what our um, individual abilities are. And we try to stay within those. We don't try to get too far out of that when we're on, on to serious subjects. Again, it's another thing if you're, if you're having fun, you, you do whatever you want and whatever you're passionate about. But, uh, but when you're trying to make your living, Tracy, that's the thing that, that is really important. And it gets very confusing in the entrepreneurial world because, and I'm sure this, this applies also to the music side because I see it in my friends who are in, in the music business, is that you get, you get uh, confused about what entrepreneurism really is. I mean, in, to me, um, there's, a, there's a whole concept of entrepreneurism, and it deals with a couple of different aspects. I mean, one is the, is the point about uncertainty, mm-hmm. is that entrepreneurism has a high level of uncertainty in it. And you have to figure out how comfortable you are dealing with uncertainty in a lot of areas of your life. You know, I had an uncle, has, I have an uncle, who worked for the utility company in Stamford, Connecticut. And he, he had built his life around security, around certainty, is probably a better way to say it, around certainty. Uh-huh. His whole objective was to be able to go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, come home at 5 o'clock, and when he walked out of the door to leave his job behind him, come home and watch baseball. That was his objective. Right. Um, and be with his family. He did not want to carry forward responsibilities. He didn't want to have to come home and practice or study or write. He Mm -hmm. wanted to just relax. And he built his whole life that way because he had a clear understanding of how comfortable he was with this whole subject of, of uncertainty. And he wasn't very comfortable. So he built his life correctly, not correctly, but that one that suited him around these subjects. I think that's a really important subject to understand about entrepreneurism. And I see it in my friends in the music world is that music has an incredibly high level of uncertainty in it. Yeah. And being able to, to match that uncertainty with what your comfort level is, will be critical to your ability to, to, to do, do well in what you do. Um, you know, in the other area, Uh, besides uncertainty is structure is that large corporations, large organizations have a high level of structure where entrepreneurism is a low level of structure. Actually, as you know, everyone knows it starts out with no structure and it's your job to put structure into something that doesn't exist at all Mm -hmm. and try to make something of it. Again, it's your ability to perform in that structured versus unstructured environment. And along with that goes motivation. You know, where does your motivation come from? Does it come from within you? Are you self-motivated or do you need to be motivated? Um, And and knowing that about yourself will make a big difference in your ability to execute well in these environments. You know, and I look at music... Music making, performance, music performance looks to me a lot like entrepreneurism because you're in a highly um, unstructured environment and you're in a highly um, uncertain environment Uh, because watching my friend Kendall, even when he was principal at Minnesota, yes, it looks like a structured environment, but Boy, it really isn't. I mean, you have a lot of self-motivation. You have to do. You have to do a lot of preparation that no one's telling you to do. You have to decide how much you do yourself, and then you're really only as good as your last performance. And yeah, it's a tough environment, and that is the entrepreneurial environment. That's I I appreciate the you, that you connected all of those things into a musician's life. Just just a musician. Um, performance, if you're only taking into consideration 
the performance aspect, because you're right. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of um, unstructure that you have to create for yourself. You have to structure your life in, in a way that you can find time to practice and prepare for your performances. You're only as good as your last performance is totally correct. And so um, moving forward into the future is, is what I'm talking about so much on this podcast and, you know, on my blog and Facebook page and everything on Crushing Classical, that thinking about yourself as more of an entrepreneur, as a musician, is going to be the direction that people will have to go as orchestras um, aren't as aren't thriving as much as they used to be as there's less orchestras as there's way too many musicians for the amount of jobs that are available and so the way that you just put it where the structure of being a musician already is really entrepreneurial just in and of itself because you have to you have to you can't leave your job behind you and not do anything else for the rest of the day or weekend or whatever because you have to stay in shape and you have to be prepared so that there's so much of that already built into being a musician that maybe it's not as much of a stretch but to be you know to think of your life and your career as an entrepreneur um but on the other hand there's that structure provided for you by having a job and so that's that's what's hard i think about about the 21st century musician the musician going into the future that with less jobs that there are, people are going to start having to think of themselves more as entrepreneurs in in the business side of building something for themselves, building, you know, a school, building a um, camp or, a you know, all these different kinds of things, you know, their own ensembles. And so that's why I was so interested in having you on to to hear your perspective of of the entrepreneur life. So, you know, I just watched... <clears throat> the Pittsburgh symphony go through um, some turmoil. Our family has friends there. We we know Bill Cavallaro well, who's the principal there in the horn section. And, and, you know, there is a perfect example of a, an organization that's been around forever provides good structure for the musicians, but through circumstances, they end up on strike for, I think it was almost two months. Uh-huh. And people took salary changes and they, you know, were debating on whether they keep all the musicians. I mean, you, you go from an environment that looks like a structured environment with that has a fair amount of security to a situation that's highly, um, un- highly uncertain. So I think, I think being able to to judge those things and evaluate them is probably going to be as important as anything, Tracy, that when you do take that gig as fourth horn in Cleveland or, you know, third horn in Phoenix, that it may look like a structured and uh, sound job, but I think you have to, in the back of your mind, always understand that these, that I think going forward, as you properly forecast that the security of these organizations is going to become less and less. Mm -hmm. And that what, what may, what may historically have looked as a structured, secure environment perhaps is not. And being able to, to build those, those things into your into your life that give you that security and that certainty in case your job doesn't have it. You know, in my case, for example, my whole, um, you know, my bo- the bulk of my professional career has been in, in unstructured and uncertain environments. The one thing I've tried to maintain <clears throat> is my family, my home, my house, I try never to change that. I live in the same home in Connecticut that I've lived for 30 years you know, because I have to have something that is not going to change on me. Right. Um, and so I think figuring out how you put that together for yourself. You know, one of the things you and I talked about at one point was 
when musicians decide they want to look for other options and they want to pursue entrepreneurial options, I think one, you know we've gone through selective competition and figuring out what your world class skill is and and you know making sure that when you compete you're doing it using your world class talent um, and not your passion because you'll go broke if you just use your passion that's not tied with world class talent. Um, but we've been through that. But to me, figuring out um, what is that world class talent you have that may be something you you haven't really evaluated properly. It may be that you're really good at creative writing, mm-hmm. really good like you are at at uh, taking and and pulling ideas out of people and putting them together in a new way, um, and and using that. And letting the letting the thing that you're passionate about becoming a little bit less the generator of your um, your personal wealth and your personal satisfaction for achievement, uh, because it will be if you if you do this, and I've seen it too many times in the entrepreneurial world, where people just assert they're going to become an entrepreneur. We see this in the university where people decide, okay, I'm going to take an entrepreneurial major. I contend you do not learn entrepreneurism. You either are or you aren't. It's like a musician. You know, Tracy, you either have this talent or you do not. You don't go to IU or Juilliard or Curtis to learn to be a musician. (laughs) Right. Right. You don't do that. (laughs) You already are. And then you go and you hone your skills in a particular area. Yes. You gain the knowledge you need. You know, it's, it's like, um, it's like the, you know, what, what my friend here in Phoenix, Gabe Kovach, who's the principal in Phoenix says to, about his students, you know, he has a, a unique approach to teaching and it's that he teaches what he thinks the student needs to know at that point to be able to do what they need to do. So he doesn't teach transposition for the sake of transposition. He only teaches transposition when it becomes clear the student needs that for what they need to do. Um, you, you, and, and entrepreneurism is, an, is a similar way. You need to know what you don't know, but you need to know how to get it when you need it. Um, and going to a university and, and deciding you're going to become an entrepreneurial, a major in entrepreneurism, to me is just... Um, it's not, that's not what you need to do. Um, because that's not going to make you an entrepreneur, just like going to a great university and and deciding you're going to be a music major is going to make you into a musician. You know, it's, it's all about this point about finding your world-class skill. So tell me about that. You, is it really a major now? Entrepreneurism is a major? Gosh, I hate to tell you. Yes. Yes. It's not only a major in business at the undergraduate level, it's also now a major in the graduate school. So you can you can get an MBA with a, a major in entrepreneurism. It's nuts. It's that doesn't different. make sense. Entrepreneurism <laughs> isn't it it's not a thing. It's, I mean <laughs> I completely agree, but <laughs> but a lot of people don't agree with us, Tracy, on this really? subject. But you know, there's another there's another concept here that that I want to get across um, is that, uh, you know, I, I, I focus heavily on this point about selective competition and world-class talent. But the reason I do beyond the things we've talked about is there's another concept that we have that when we think about the subject, and, and that is that brand matters. Okay. So... To me, what, one of the things that, that opens up opportunities for you is your ability to, uh, to work within a brand. So take, for example, Bernard Scully, who is a member, among many things, he's a member of the Canadian Brass. Mm-hmm. That being the fact that he's the hornist at the Canadian Brass opens up enormous opportunities for him. He's, he's all over the world. He's meeting every major musician uh, because he, they play with all the orchestras around the world. Yeah. And he is then, that opens up a whole world of opportunities for Mer- Bernard because he's associated with a, with a world-class brand. Yes. 
He can become associated with that world-class brand because he's using his world-class talent. I see. And he's honed it. He's gained all the knowledge he needs. He's honed that skill with Doug Hill and others and Kendall and, you know, many others, Hermann Baumann. And he's, he's then now using it, using that in a world-class way with a world-class brand. You know, I happen to be uh, died and gone to heaven because I went to Columbia. I'm now at Columbia University. And another story that you'll appreciate from the Carolinas My father, when I first was named entrepreneur in residence at Columbia years ago, I called my father and said, hey, dad, I've been, you know, just got this new position at Columbia University. There was dead silence at the other end of the the phone. And he said, you mean, are you talking about Columbia University in in New York City, the Ivy League school? (laughs) I said, yeah, dead silence. He goes, well, you always were really good at music. Interesting. So he had no clue about this point about world-class talent and and no clue about how it fit into into the rest of the world. Now, my father himself was brilliant. He was valedictorian at Duke, but he viewed the world in a very different way than I do. His, his world was different, and he saw me not as someone who could be at Columbia because I was excelling as an entrepreneur, but he was viewing me as a child and saying, you know, well, when I saw you, you were pretty good at music, so that must be what you're there for. <laughs> oh, he didn't even connect why you were there nope. when you first mm-hmm. told him. Now, what allows me to be at Columbia is that I do have a pretty good business building capabilities. And I do, you know, I'm pretty good technologist and I do research and writing in the area of the strategic use of technology and its management. But I can only do that because I'm, I'm kind of world-class at that level and being associated with Columbia, doing it at Columbia gives me, opens up opportunities for me that I would never get if I weren't at Columbia, if I were at University of South Carolina or Arizona State University, I would never get the opportunities I get. I'm still the same person. Yep. But the fact that I'm able to be associated with a brand matters. Exactly. So sometimes people are going to have to build their own brand if they if they don't have the ability to um, associate themselves with an already world class brand. And that's, I think, the challenge moving forward for musicians, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so not forgetting that being associated with a world-class brand is an important aspect of what you do. And as you said, whether you are able to, as in my case or Bernard's case, you're able to become part of a longstanding brand, world-class brand, or you have to go build it yourself it can be done, but you have it's part of what you have to do is yes. that world class or be associated with a world class brand. That makes sense. And it's harder, obviously, when you have to build it yourself. Uh, it takes longer. It's not established and everything else, but it's absolutely true. You know, I, I spoke with um, Denise Tryon recently. We did an interview and she mentioned the same thing, you know, that when she was affiliated with the Philadelphia Orchestra, you know, that was when the heads started to turn, even though she was the exact same player and everything else. When she had the Philly Orchestra on her resume, people paid more attention than when it when it was Detroit. Not that there's anything wrong with Detroit. It's just Philadelphia is a top five, and that's what it ended up being the reality of it, you know? Just like you said, if you if you're if it wasn't Columbia University, if it was, you know, University of Illinois, or I don't know, just name any other one. one, Because I I did one of my degrees there. So use that. You won't, you won't offend me. Okay. (laughs) I I did one year there actually. (laughs) No, but you know, this is a, there's a concept we have in business called position power. And uh, it's important that you understand the difference between personal power and position power. When you're, when you're an entrepreneur, you it it you're building what you're building 
based on personal power. You take a soloist like Hermann Baumann or Barry Tuckwell or even Dennis Brain, who I think are more soloist than than a than an orchestra player. Um, their brand was built on their personal power. Uh, it wasn't the fact that Dennis Brain played with the Philharmonia, right? I mean, it, I'm not even sure that was the only one. I think he played for more than just them. But, or Barry Tuckwell played with the London Symphony. Mm-hmm. We remember those people because of the fact of their personal power. Um, and it's important to realize what do you have the ability to do? Are you going to be able to build a personal power or are you going to need to use a position power? You know, and, and here's what I did with my own life is – you know, I started out in a structured organization that I found was IBM, right? Was, again, a world-class place, at the, especially at the time. I'm not so sure that it's world-class today, but it was when I was there. And the training for management and for uh, the skills of organiz- organizing and managing things were, was outstanding. But the structure of IBM was stifling to me. And the environment was way too political and politics mattered. You, you had to, again, funny, you had to play golf and I didn't want to play golf anymore, right? Right. <laughs> and um, and your, the evaluation of your personal performance was way too far removed from what you actually accomplished. And I wanted to, to get, get rid of all that stuff. Um, so I went from being someone that my power as an individual was the fact I was associated with the IBM brand Mm -hmm. because once I was out of IBM, it didn't matter. Nobody cared anymore. Um, The point you just made uh, about uh, Denise, right? Was that it, it changes when you, when you move from brand to brand, but if you've associated yourself with a brand, but if you built your personal power, as an entrepreneur has to do, um, and it's hard, and it gets back to this point about brand, you have to build a personal brand. You have to build that, and, and it switches from being uh, that you're it's that you're associating yourself with with an organizational power or a position within an organization to your own personal power. So take me, for example. I've gotten to the point where I don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to continue having to live on my personal power. Um, And so I went back to now at this phase of my, my career, I've gone back to an organization where it's more important, my position within an organization and my power now comes just as much from me as it does from Columbia university and, and figuring that out in your arc of your career is important is do you have the stuff to build a personal brand like Barry Tuckwell, Dennis Brain, Hermann Bauma, Bernard Scully? Um, or are you better suited to be put a, put yourself into a, a position of power um, and associate with the brand? being with a Philly orchestra or being with a Pittsburgh symphony or the New York Philharmonic um, or great places like IU or Curtis or Eastman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just something people have to navigate for themselves. And as, as there's more and more musicians in the marketplace there, the personal power thing is going to have to be developed and it, it might not even always be, personal power coming from world-class soloist level, Absolutely. you know, it could be world-class, whatever to level, you know, just whatever it ends up being, but you're right. It has to be world-class. It has to be, it has to be, you know, great. Well, take, for example, take, for example, the, one of the skills that's really important, that's commonly ignored is your, is what I call fit. So it's how well do you fit the situation? Because you can, and and this is such a a subjective area. It's not an objective area. You know, I watched Kendall, for example, Kendall Betts at Minnesota Orchestra, where certain 
uh, music directors and conductors, he fit perfectly. They loved him. They loved his playing. And he felt very comfortable and at home. And he could do great music making. But there were times when conductors would come in or a new music director would be appointed and he didn't fit at all. And that became a really uncomfortable situation. You know, my friend Bill Caballero talks about the same thing. He's been at Pittsburgh a long time. And he talks about how certain conductors, he just felt so comfortable. I mean, Manfred Honig is an example. He loves uh, Manfred Honig and Manfred Honig loves him. And it, it's such a different environment uh, when you fit. And, and understanding that aspect of fit is really important also. And it's the it's business. It's the same way. It's your ability to fit, and and Bill contends. Bill Cavallaro contends that the broader your ability to fit into many situations, the better off you are. Um, and I think that's really applicable across the board. I know it is in business, and it it seems to me, based on my friends in, in the music business, that it's really important. Your ability to fit. You know, I think the days of Talent over fit are becoming rarer. So, you know, we, we see in business a lot now where people who are really, really talented and people will forgive their quirks and their, their lack of fit. And I think that is starting to decline rapidly. And I think in the music world, I've seen it firsthand where your ability to fit personally and having the social skills that allow you to fit into situations and, and differing demands will be just as important as being a well-honed talent. That makes a whole lot of sense. It really does. Um, and it's great advice, you know, to be, and, and one of the things Bernard mentioned in his, um, in his interview was being um, someone who can reflect upon um, the surroundings and what's, what the current, you know, situation is with his career. And I think that would, to figure out if you're a fit would be something that you would need to reflect on and, and look into, you know, the situation and see, see, and, 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 and figure out if you are fitting in the situation. So you know, the self, self-reflection, Bernard is a, he and I both uh, in college studied philosophy and um, this, the, the ability to self-reflect in a clean way, in, a, in an intellectually honest and clean way is a, is a big deal. Um, yeah. and again, I think that a lot of times it, it separates out uh, the people that can perform at a high level. You know, unfortunately we have, we have examples that are clear where people who lack self-reflection, lack sophistication, um, lack good social graces, um, rise to incredible levels of, of business and musicianship and, and politics and you name it. And yeah. fortunately, they are, we see this happening. And yes, it happens. Um, but I don't think those are the examples that we should emulate or we should teach our children or mentor our friends with. Um, I think uh, pursuing excellence and wisdom is still the, um, you know, and, and obviously um, having a strong moral foundation. I think those are really the things that we should all pursue regardless of examples we may see that, that run counter to that. Um, and I think I, I, and I know we all have done this at certain parts of our life. We see people that, that appear to be incredibly successful and they have these quirks. And so we, we tend to, sometimes we excuse them in ourselves. And I think that's a, um, that is a, um, not, not something we should be doing. I think as Bernard properly says, the ability to pursue um, self-reflection is, is one of the aspects of success that we should, we should be teaching ourselves. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. 
Um, so, Tom, I always ask my guests on the show um, about a defining moment in their career where they were at a crossroads. And you you kind of said, screw this, I'm going in, in this unsafe route. So I want to know um, if you, where, when in your career, if and when, you had that moment where you, you had a, a moment where you could stay on the safe path and just certainty was the name of the game and you... It was not working for you anymore, and you chose the unknown. So, do you have a moment like that? I do, and and look, I do appreciate that. I, I I'm a follower of your podcast, so I do appreciate the fact that for a nice Southern Baptist like me, you you tone down the question. Uh, <laughs> I said that's very kind of you, uh, but uh, you know, it was when I left IBM uh, okay. back at the uh, year two thousand. Um, you know, I, I mentioned to you already that it was stifling to me and I had this situation where I had, I had, I had calculated out how many years I'd have to work to retire. And I thought, you know, if you're, if you're doing that, there's gotta be something wrong. Yeah. And, and so I thought this is crazy. Uh, and I can't continue to function in this environment because it was just, I, I was chomping at the bit for the reasons we've talked about. Um, and so I gave up a retirement. I gave up a good career because I'd already risen to a very pretty high level at IBM at that point. And, um, but it just didn't fit me. Uh, and I could see that I was going to, it was going to get worse, not better. And so you know, I gave it up and it was uh, one of those moments where a friend of mine who has become a partner of mine, he's a venture capitalist and he was continuing to try to talk me out of IBM. And, um, uh, this went on for about a year and he would say things to me like, well, look, I've got this company. Why don't you come run this company? I would say, are you, what do you mean? I mean, how do you, how do you make that kind of a judge? You're going to give up a job and a retirement and go run a company. What happens if it doesn't work? He goes, there'll be other companies. <laughs> you know what you go, you go, <laughs> you go. So this is it's so far removed from the way that you think when you've when you've worked in structured environments to, to yeah. that kind of an environment. Um, but I finally and finally his argument was look, it's we're turning the century. It's gonna be the year two thousand. Uh, why don't you start the whole century off by doing something completely different? Um and I, so I went to IBM, said, I'm going to quit. Well, they made me stay until um, early April because they wanted me to finish up some things I was doing. But, but, uh, but I then did that, and, and I was reflecting on this, on this subject not too long ago and thinking, my goodness, I, would, I guarantee you I would not be where I am today. I would probably be you know, out retired and playing golf in North Carolina, Tracy would be what I'm doing, what I'm doing <laughs> instead of this. Um, and I'm so happy that I, um, that I'm not doing that. Uh, so that was, that was the moment when I just said, you know what, I don't fit this. I really don't. That's great. So you left IBM before you started building a new business. Is that correct? I did. That's even riskier. I just, I, and by the way, I had no idea what the company was that Eric had, had told me he w wanted me to go run. I mean, I had no idea. <laughs> you just have no idea. I don't suggest that that's a good idea for other people. <laughs> but it won't be, you know, I mean, I think that's a, um, that's a, a pretty drastic move. Yeah. Um, um, you know, living with uncertainty is not something that bothers me too much. So. That's that's something to strive for, you know? I mean, the truth is, as we all want certainty, but really, is there really a such thing? I think maybe the certainty comes from just, you know, believing that there's a such thing as certainty, but Pittsburgh Symphony people thought they were certain that that would never happen, yeah. you know, or whatever. So there's, it's, you look around and we fabricate that everything is certain if we choose a certain way, but really there isn't any certainty there sure sure it sure isn't in the business world and there sure isn't in the music world so you know well we wouldn't be playing horn if we wanted certainty we'd be playing That's true you play the piano or something 
Exactly. You'd be playing the piano because you hit a note and you know it's going to come out. That's going to be a C sharp when you hit it. <laughs> exactly. I know. <laughs> You're not so sure on the when you play the horn. Oh my gosh. Tell me about it. I know. So, um, Tom, I have fi- uh, two final questions for you. The first one is what is the one habit or behavior you've developed that has made the most difference in your career so far? It's being a constant learner. I think if you're not a constant learner, you become stale. Yeah. And we see it in people who are just out of college and we see people who are retired and everybody in between. I think you have to be a constant learner. And along with that constant learning, I think it's important to pursue wisdom, excellence, high moral values. You know, I think you have to stay that way. It's the only way you you maintain a vital life, whether it be your professional life, your passion, whatever it is, you've got to maintain that, that ability to be a constant learner. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And thank goodness for the internet, right? I mean. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Incredible tool. You know, yeah. for me to do research, where if I were doing the work I'm doing at Columbia now, if I were doing that even 10 years ago, I'd spend my life in the library. Yeah. Not the life, but, you know, I'd spend hours in the library. I can spend hours here at my beautiful home in Arizona overlooking the mountains doing it on the internet. It's unbelievable. Yeah. The things you know, that are so available great. to you. <laughs> it's so great. I learned so much since the internet became a regular thing that everyone has, you know, just unbelievable things, you know. Um, so my last question is, who in the classical world inspires you? And tell me why in one sentence. If possible. <laughs> <laughs> Can it be a long run on sentence? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, it's world class music making is still to this day uh, inspires me, you know, whether it's beautiful singing or beautiful horn playing. You know, if I if I think about in the orchestra, I heard uh, the Pittsburgh Symphony this summer in Aspen uh, and, you know, hearing my friend. Bill Cavalier on that horn section play. It was just incredibly inspiring. And hearing Bernard performing solo performances, whether it's his solo album, which was incredible, uh, the recital album, or it's listening to him, you know, do a performance with a Canadian brass, or to go uh, back even what I was doing yesterday was playing with my, you know, music collection and listening to Vince DeRosa um, in the studio. I mean, just to me, that's still... The most pure horn sound is the DeRosa sound, and, and, and it's what I try to emulate myself. You know, and I'm leaving out some great people here, not by any means deliberately. You know, Jen Montone, Gabe, Julie Landsman, Kendall Betts. I mean, I could keep going, going, going. Sarah Willis. I mean, they're wonderful players that when I hear them play, and I hear a recital, for example, or you see a YouTube that Sarah Willis does and she plays the Till Eulenspiegel and you say, oh my gosh, or Julie Landsman, even on her on her website, hear her doing the, the long call. I mean, it's, it's astounding music making. And to this day, that I think is still the one thing that inspires me the most is hearing this incredible music making. And whenever I have a day off, like I had a day off yesterday, and i listen the whole day to, to old recordings of DeRosa doing stuff. Um, and so to me, that is it. Now I just gave you a paragraph with a one sentence beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you made your own rules. <laughs> well, okay. Entrepreneurs tend to be a little bit like that. You know, we follow some rules and break others, but. That's how it goes, right? It is. It is. It's knowing which ones you can get away with breaking. You know, it's like being in the military. You learn very early on in the in basic training. You know, which are the rules you better follow, and which ones can you kind of ignore? <laughs> you know. Yeah, and they always say it's it's easier to um, ask for forgiveness than permission. Is that right? Yes, except it wasn't that way when I was a young young boy in South Carolina. But um, there, the rules were pretty strict. But <laughs> 
I bet. But I agree. It's been a real pleasure uh, trying to connect the entrepreneurial world with the with the music world. I haven't had to try to do that in a long, long time, and it was a, it was a real pleasure, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, you so me. much. Thank you so much for being on, and I really uh, totally appreciate your insights. And it's it's so valuable. I know it's so valuable for my audience. So thank you so much, Tom. Well, you're welcome. It's it's a true pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you're enjoying Crushing Classical, please write a review on iTunes. And be sure to connect with me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Crushing Classical and on Instagram as Crushing Classical. So thank you. Join in the conversation and I will see you next time. Bye.